Father, we do thank you so much, God, for uh, letting us do ministry and, and be able to, to do some outreach uh, uh, worldwide. And Lord, yet, thank you for the ministry that we have right here. And, and Lord, that your desire is to work in our hearts. Your desire is to grow us and mature us and encourage us. And so, Lord, we do want to listen with hearts, God, that are open to you, that are open for what you have for us. And Lord, we want to we tell you right now, have your way with us. God, speak to us directly, Lord, for the future, for the present. And God, we just want to know you more. We want to love you more. And Lord, we want to draw close to you. So bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, as we did leave off, if you remember, Paul has been trying to get to Jerusalem. Remember, he was up in Asia Minor, in that area. He's worked his way. If you remember, then we got to Caesarea, and then finally he made his way up, and we left him off right when he's getting into, into Jerusalem. So he's been, in my mind, months trying to get there, and he's had this desire. Remember, he wanted to get there for uh, Passover. That didn't happen. Now he's trying to get there for Pentecost and working to get there. And if you remember, he's bringing that gift of financial help for the church in Jerusalem, kind of to do that bonding with the church and in, in, uh, with the Gentile church and the Jewish church and bring them together. So he has all of these ideas. And, and here's what I'm thinking, man. He gets there. He's got to be excited, right? He finally made it, man. He's in Jerusalem. Remember, he's at Nason's house where we left off, and he's hanging out, and he's ready to talk to the church. And, and I can just sense, you know, when, whenever you get to share with somebody about what God's doing, it's always so exciting. And I think Paul's like on, on the crisp of just kind of coming undone because he's done so much over the last couple of years since he's really sat down and talked to the church in Jerusalem. So he's ready to share, but he's going to be so misunderstood. And what do we do when we're misunderstood? What, what happens when we come with all of this zeal and excitement and all of a sudden somebody like, like just puts a pin in a balloon, right? And everything's gone. What's our reaction to that? And I pray that we can learn from Paul how to have a proper reaction, a right reaction, even when things don't go the way we think they should. And my biggest prayer is as we watch Paul and what goes on in, in his life, that that would encourage us for our own lives as we walk through things that we can trust the Lord no matter what it looks like uh, in front of us or around us. So let's go to, let's go to verse 15 just to kind of catch up and be there. It says, after these days, we packed and we went up to Jerusalem and also some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain Nason from Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. So remember, they came and they came from Caesarea and remember all of the obstacles that were in front of Paul to get to Jerusalem, right? Right? People are telling him not to go. Every place he went, people said, don't go. You don't want to go. It's not a good idea. And we talked about that. Now he's finally there. And he's at Nason's house. Then it says in, in verse 17, when we had finally come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And on the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. Now look at man. He goes and, and, and he finds where the leadership is. And here's what's interesting to me. It says they went with, the, with James and the rest of the elders. But you notice who's not mentioned? Peter, John, Matthew, Bartholomew, you know, the big guys, right? They're not mentioned. And some of the commentators say, well, they must have not been there. I'm not sure that's true. By this time, James had, had risen up as the leader of the church, and, and it's okay that he was the leader of the church, and they're coming alongside of him, and it says the other elders are there, so I'm kind of thinking they were around. They're just not mentioned by name, but he's there with these elders, and now he's ready, man. He wants to let them know what God has been doing in the Gentile church and what the Lord has done in, through him in the lives of others. And again, like Thursday night, we're going to be sharing what God has done in the lives of people that we got to come in contact with. So it tells us, listen, in, in verse 19, and when we had been greeted, he told them in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, 
They glorified the Lord. Listen, Paul began to talk about what happened in Corinth, what happened in Thessalonica, what happened in Athens, what happened in in Ephesus, all of these places he had been. Can you imagine? Listen, and it says he told them in detail. I don't think this was just like a one meeting thing. I think it's taken a while, and he's sharing the things, and, and I just imagine he's getting more excited as he's sharing, and they're glorifying the Lord, they're praising the Lord, and it seems good, right? Everybody is like, yes, God is alive and well, God is working around the world, and it's, to me, it's always exciting to see what God is doing around the world. And so you gotta, you got to kind of feel the, the sense of joy in people's hearts and the sense of joy in Jerusalem. Now, the one thing that Luke doesn't mention is that they gave them the financial gift. There's nothing about that. It's interesting that that's not even, you know, to the forefront, yet that was the whole purpose of going to Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, he doesn't mention it till chapter 24 when he's recounting things about it. So it's almost like that took the back seat, that that whole help for the church in Jerusalem was a good thing, but it almost took a back seat to, here's what God is doing around the world, and we need to rejoice in that. And I, so I sense, man, there's a sense of yes, and I think Paul is like, Paul is like way up here, you know what I mean? You're like, yes! And there's joy going on, and then out comes the pen. Listen what they say in the middle of verse 20. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed. Now listen, that's telling, me, that's telling me it wasn't just James and the elders. That's telling me there were thousands of people there listening. When, it, when the Bible says myriads or multitude, that means there's a, there's a ton of people there. And here's what they're saying. We hear what's going on in, 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 in the world, in the Gentile world, but look at all the Jews that are getting saved. That's got to be a cause for celebration, right? A little bit of joy going on. But then they add this little caveat that's kind of scary, right? Look at the myriads of, uh, of Jews there are who have believed, and they're all zealous for the law. Listen, these guys, you got to remember something. The church began as coming out of Judaism. The people who got saved, the apostles were Jews, and then they got saved. They were raised, it was ingrained in their life. Everything about Judaism was part of their life from the time they were children until now. Listen, you don't just dump all of that. That doesn't just go away because you accept Jesus. And so there's still, listen, there's still this stuff they brought in with them and some of it's good, some of it's bad. And it's okay, listen, it's okay to keep on with some of the traditions. It's okay to do some of the things, but you can't do them as a means for salvation, nor can you do them as a means to please God, but you can do them because that's what you do. And so listen, man, these guys, are, it says they're still zealous. They're still, they still have zeal for the law. And then they tell them this, but, verse 21, they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles, to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. They're saying, Paul, here's the problem. It's being told there's gossip, right? It's being told that here's what you're doing. Did Paul do that? No. He didn't tell the Jews not to circumcise their kids. He didn't speak against Moses. He taught the truth, but he never did that. He went into the synagogues to reach the Jews. And and so listen, it's been told. So a couple things, man, when I hear this, a couple things really bug me. Number one, hey, James, why aren't you telling the people who are saying this? Now, I'm going to get real blunt here. Why don't you tell them to shut up, right? Why, why, why are we letting this go on? Number one, why is the church telling Paul this is what's being said about you and they're not doing anything about it? It's kind of a drag, isn't it? I gotta be really honest. If I come to the church and I'm telling the church about some great things God's doing and the church, says, the leadership of the church tells me, oh, Pat, we understand, but here's what's being said about you and this is what's being told about you and it's an absolute falsehood, I'm gonna be a little bit upset. Wouldn't you be a little bit upset? Here's what I'm thinking, James, I don't like you anymore. And give us our money back. 
right? I mean, come on, that's gonna, that's gonna be a little bit, you're a little bit hurtful. It's a matter of, it's gotta be kind of, I think, almost devastating. You're way up here now, you're way down here. Don't you think they would have his back? Shouldn't we have each other's back? Shouldn't we be brothers and sisters when we hear gossip that we would tell people to stop it? That that's not true? Didn't they just have, well, it's been a couple years, didn't they have that big meeting about what it took to be saved back in Acts chapter 15? Didn't they come together and talk about, here's the issue, and here's what it takes to be saved, the blood of Jesus Christ, period. And now it's being told that Paul's going around, he doesn't care if they circumcise their kids. It's okay if they're following the customs of Moses. He never did any of that. But it's been said, you know, you know how crippling and horrible and destructive gossip is? It doesn't take much either, does it? It's one little thing goes out and it spreads and it goes. And Paul, here's what we're being told about, you know. I, I have read on, but at this point I like to pretend I haven't. And I'm thinking, what's Paul going to do? What would your reaction be? I kind of shared you guys what my reaction would be. I would be upset. I'd be bummed out. I might even be questioning, God, where are you in the midst of this? I trusted you, and I stepped out, and I did these things, and now look what I get repaid with. Even those closest to me, even those that, 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 that are brothers in the Lord that are serving alongside me, are, they're not defending me. They're just saying, here's what's being said. Oh, they did give him, oh, they did tell him this. Look at verse 22. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. So here's what he's saying. The, we're going to get even bigger. More people are going to come. We have to come together because everybody knows you're here. So verse 23, therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Now, here's what's kind of crazy. Here's what they say. We got a plan. Paul, don't worry. We got a plan. We know how to fix this. And here's what I'm thinking. If you had enough time to make a plan, didn't you have enough time to stop the gossip, right? Come on, man, you got a plan? I would say maybe I don't want to be part of your plan. So just do what we tell you. you that's amazing. I mean, that just blows my mind. Do what we tell you. It says, listen, we have four men who have taken a vow. Verse 24, take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things which they uh, were informed concerning you are nothing, but, are nothing but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. Here we got a plan, Paul. These guys have taken the Nazarite vow, Numbers chapter 6. Now, do you remember? Do you remember just a couple, well, about a year ago? Not here, a year ago here, a year ago in, in, in Paul's time. A couple months ago, chapter 18, you remember chapter 18? Paul took a Nazarite vow, remember? He cut his hair in Centuria, and he's going to, do the, to, to fulfill the vow that he had taken. I, I don't think there's anything wrong. Listen, there's nothing wrong with what they've done. So here's what they're saying. Just go and pay their expenses. It's oftentimes it was costly. You had to get sacrifices. You had to take time off of work. You had to do things. So here's what they're saying. Paul, take part of this with them to show the church the Jewish believers, listen, this isn't the world. This is a church to show all of the Jewish believers that we're okay. Can you do that for us? What would you say? Don't answer out loud. <laughs> what are you going to say? You're Paul, what are you going to say? We want to do this. Now listen, he's worked really hard to let the Jews know the Gentiles are with them. Now here's kind of what's going on here. Now it's almost reversed and he's got to let the Jews know that he's with them. That it's okay. That'd be a hard decision, wouldn't it? Are you, I don't think it's an area of compromise, compromise. But I think it's an area of compromise. In other words, I don't think it's an area of compromising morals or compromising convictions. But it's an area of, does he really have to do it? No, he doesn't have to do it. He could tell them all to pack sand and he's going back to... Antioch, and he'll just stay in that area and work with the Gentiles, and you Jews can do what you Jews are going to do. These are Jewish believers. You've got to get that in your heart, not, not the Jews. They're going to come up in a minute. 
Do you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 9? We read that a while back. I'm just going to read part of it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, what did Paul say? To the Jew, I become a Jew. To those under the law, I've become as one under the law, although I myself am not under the law. To those without the law, I become one as without the law, although I'm under the law of Christ. I become all things to all men so that some might be saved. He's written that already. He's already written that letter. In Romans chapter 9, what did he say? Romans chapter 9, he says, as much as it depends on you, you're to live at peace with all men. Were those just words? You just write those things that they sound nice, they're great verses to memorize, or do you flesh them out? This is huge, isn't it? Hey, Paul, you're going to flesh that out? I don't know. I'm really mad right now. Isn't it hard to walk with the Lord when you're mad? Hmm? You get all angry? Yeah. Listen, man, I don't want to do it, Jesus. And he's going, just do it, man. Just go, just go do it, Paul. I don't want to do it. I'm mad. They didn't take up for me. So what? You don't need them. All you need is Jesus, right? So, Paul, are you going to step out or are you going to do it? And, oh, by the way, they, they throw this little caveat in there so, so he's not too upset. Verse 25, but concerning the Gentiles who believe, we also have written and decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idol, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Remember, they're going, hey, we already took care of the Gentiles. We're not worried about the Gentiles right now. What we're worried about is the, the Jewish part of the church. And are we going to keep the church together? Or are we going to split? Once again, you have that opportunity. Are we going to split the church apart? Or are we going to bring the church together? And oftentimes, it's resting on Paul, man. I can't believe the amount of pressure that this one person faced in ministry time after time. But you know what else I love about Paul? Paul took risks. Paul wasn't afraid to step out. You see, and that, this is the amazing thing. Look at the, look at the next verse. Then Paul took them in. He did it, man. He's not afraid to step out. Listen, so many of us, we don't grow in our Christian lives because we're not going to take any risks. We want to stay safe. We don't, we don't want, listen, we're not out there sharing because if we share with somebody, you know, somebody might criticize us and somebody might come against us and somebody might find out who we are. So we stay in our safe little place. We don't give anybody advice. We don't help people because it might be wrong. And we stay safe. And listen, we never grow in our Christianity. We're kind of just, we're kind of just existing. Do you want to just exist or do you want to, do you want to be used by God? So you got to step out and you got you got to take some risk. You got to do some things. You got to get out of your comfort zone and, and you know what? You got to step out and so what if you fail? Coming from one who's failed, it's okay. It's all right to fail. Cuz you know what? We got a God that's bigger than us. And we got a God that loves us and you know what? He'll just pick you up, he'll dust you off, he'll rub a little dirt on it. And tell you, let's get going. And so listen, man, don't be one who's not going to move because you're paralyzed by the idea that you might do something wrong. It bothers me. You know, I read a lot of commentaries, and there's, there's like, it's divided. It's like Paul was the great compromiser here. And, and I'm thinking, man, I don't want to be that guy when I get to heaven having to talk to him about what I said about him being a compromiser, you know, when, when I'm teaching through the book of Acts. I, I don't think he's compromising in the sense of compromising convictions I think he's, listen, here's what I think he is. I think he's humbling himself to the leadership of that church and saying, if that's what you want to do, if that's what you think is the best thing to do, let's go for it. What's the worst thing that can happen? I'll spend a little money, cut a little hair, and, you know, and nothing happens. So let's go. So he takes him in. Oh, he doesn't know the worst that can happen. Watch what happens. Then Paul took them in, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the ex uh, expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each of them. So listen, man, I think now, I think now he's climbing back up, right? We're up here, and then shh. And then now he's going, you know what, it's okay, we're going to do this thing. And we don't know what God's going to do. And we're walking through the temple, and things are kind of good. They're purified. They're doing, they're doing the rituals. They're doing the stuff. And, and Paul's going, this is good. And then verse 27, now when the seventh days, 
seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, the Jews from Asia, where has he just come from? Asia. Remember all the turmoil he faced in Ephesus? That would probably be the Jews from Asia. Remember how angry they were at him? Now they're there. What are the Jews doing there from Asia? Why are they there? What time of year is it? Pentecost. There's millions of people in Jerusalem. Remember that that city would expand during those feast days to, you know, to a hundred times bigger than it was as, as all the men would come in. So you got all of these people there for the Feast of Pentecost and there just happened to be some Jews from Asia and it says they're there seeing him, verse 27, in the temple they stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. So they get everybody riled up and they lay hands on Paul, not laying hands on him to pray for him, by the way, but laying hands on him repeatedly and rapidly, Right? So they grab him, they get a hold of him, and then they said, verse 28, crying out, men of Israel, help. This man, this is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he has brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Whoa! Those are just outright fabrications. Paul never taught against Jews. He never taught against Moses. He never taught against the temple. He didn't do any of that. He's in the temple following something. And then they go, and he brought a Greek in here. Now you do know, you do know there was separations in the temple, right? I guess I should have got a, a, a drawing or something. But you, you, you guys remember we put it up before. When you entered into the temple area, there was the court of the Gentiles, and that's as far as a Gentile, that's as close as a Gentile could ever get. Remember when Jesus overturned the money changers' tables and stuff? You know, what, one bad thing about that, all of that was taking place in the court of the Gentiles. So it pushed Gentiles out even further. And I think that's, you know, one of the reasons he was so upset. But you had the court of the Gentiles, and then you had like a, like a four-foot wall. You had a small wall. They didn't make it big, but it separated that from the court of the women. And on that wall, there were plaques Every so often, and they, you know, basically just paraphrase it. If you cross this line and you're a Gentile, your death is on yourself. You just decided to commit suicide because we're going to kill you. Bottom line. And listen, Rome even let the Jews do that. They allowed them to execute any Greek who would cross that. So listen, now here's what they're saying. Paul brought a Greek across there. Seriously? You think he would do that? Oh, they said it because, look at what they tell us. Again, a little bit more gossip, verse 29. For they had pre previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, whom they supposed, supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. You know, an assumption is a bad thing, right? Someone said assumption is the worst form of communication. I kind of like that saying because, you know, sometimes I assume things and it's like, I shouldn't have done that. So they, because they saw Paul with Trophimus, they're thinking Trophimus is in there. Now here's, here's a question I have. Why don't you look at the men who are with him? See who they are. Here's one thing I know, they got fresh haircuts. <laughs> so their hair's not an issue, right? Come on. Oh, it gets worse. Verse 30, and all the city was disrupted. Can you imagine, man, all you want to do, listen, all you want to do is, quote, teach the Bible, man. You just want to serve Jesus. And now all of a sudden, you got this humongous riot going on. All you want to do is bring some kind of unity to the church. Now you get a huge, it's, it's an influencing the entire city. It's like out of control. And I'm thinking Paul's sitting there going, should have stayed in Ephesus, man. What on earth is happening? All the city was disturbed, and the people ran together. They seized Paul, and they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. So listen, man, they shut everything. They lock everything down. They got a hold of Paul, and it says, Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. So man, listen, man, these Jews are going to kill Paul. They're just going to murder him right there, right then. If I'm Paul, I think I'm a little bit scared now. Now I'm, I'm, not, I'm done being mad. Now I'm scared. These guys are going to, they're beating on him. I read ahead. They're beating on him. 
And so the commander hears about it, and it's, it's a riot. Listen, it's not just an issue now of someone crossing the wall. It's a riot in the city, and if you know anything about Roman law, you can't have a riot in the city, especially Jerusalem. You know what blows my mind? In, in Jerusalem at that time, they had the Antonio Fortress, and the Antonio Fortress was on the northwest corner. When we, when we go to Israel, you see the model, and, and you can see it's on the northwest corner, right, and it had stairs leading right into the court of the Gentiles. And that's where the Roman guards would stay, and they would watch, and they, they would keep an eye out because that was the hot spot. If anything was going to happen, that's, that was the epicenter. You know what's interesting today? What's the epicenter in Jerusalem today? The Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, or the Temple Mount. And they watch it like crazy. 2,000 years later, it's still that, that spot that people watch. And we got to be careful, man, because if it starts there and a riot gets out of control, we're not going to be able to control it. So the garrison commander not wanting things to happen. And here's what's kind of interesting. Who's mad, who's mad at Paul and the church right now? The Jews. All through the book of Acts, who gets mad at the church? The Jews. They're angry with the church. You want to destroy the church. You want to stop the church. And you know what's kind of crazy? Who saves them? The Roman government. It's kind of nuts when you think about it. So here he is. The commander's there. And listen, it says he sees the uproar. So he immediately took soldiers and centurions, ran down to them. <coughs> and when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Praise God, huh? Now, I'm wondering how bad he was beat. You know, do you watch stuff on the news today where they're doing crazy stuff? And, and we, see, we see, you know, to me, atrocious acts. You know, people beating on people. You see, you know, I guess it's raising up again where they're doing that sucker punch knockout. They just run up to somebody and just bang them and, and knock them out. And I think, man, how, that's just violent. Here's a thousand people beating on one guy. That's really violent, right? And they're beating on Paul. And they go, oh, the garrison's here. We've got to stop. I'm wondering, man, I'm wondering what he looks like. I'm just curious what he looks like at this point. Is, you know, is he it's, it's got swollen? Is he, you know, so they quit beating on him. And then the commander came near and took him. And then listen to this. And commanded him to be bound with two chains, chains and asked who he was and what he had done. I'm the one getting beat. The commander comes and what does he do? He arrests me and chains me to two guys. That's not fair. If I'm Paul now, I'm just really, I'm just like, what's going on? And now he's got him chained up, and it tells us, the commander saying, who is this guy? Verse 34, and some among the multitude cried one thing, and some another. So here's what's going on. Who is this guy, and what'd he do? I don't know, I'm just beating on him. Why are you beating on him? Because he's beating on him. Why are you beating on him? Because he's beating on him. I don't know what we're doing here. We're just beating on him. Wow. So he couldn't, he couldn't get any information from them. So it tells us, listen, so when he could not ascertain in the middle of verse 34 the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. Now here's what I love. And when he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. Listen, when he got to chairs, Paul did the first crowd surfing, right? And they kind of lift him up and they just kind of pass him along. Let's get him out of here so these guys don't kill him. And it's just nuts, man. They're taking him up the stairs. And then it said the multitude of the people called, followed in there. Here's what they're crying out. Away with him. Now listen, they're not saying away with him like get him out of here. They're saying get him off the planet, right? They're saying kill him. Sound familiar? Isn't it interesting that there's such a parallel between Paul and Jesus, when they both went into to Jerusalem, it's fun to kind of read those and look at those. And now they're telling them, just kill him. And then, then check this out. This is like my favorite part. Verse 37. Then Paul was about to be, then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? That just like blows my mind, man. I would be screaming. And I, I read this in, 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 in the way that it's written, like Paul goes, hey, uh, can I talk to you for a minute? Seriously? Yeah, he, he asked the guy, and look at the commander goes, you speak Greek, right? And he replied, can you speak Greek? Listen, Paul asked him in Greek. The commander's shocked that he speaks Greek. Listen, and that means he spoke Greek as a native, not Greek as a learned language, because Paul did, right? He was raised both in the Greek culture and in the Jewish culture. And so he tells him, 
can I have a word? It's like, before we go in there, can I have a word? And it's like, seriously, dude, they're trying to kill you. You speak Greek? And Paul goes, well, yeah, I do. <laughs> Listen, and then here's the funny part. Look at verse 38. Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led 4,000 assassins into the wilderness? It's like, what? <laughs> there was a guy in 54 AD. You got to understand, there was, this, there, was this, there was this rebel in 54 AD who did lead some assassins, and it was, into the, it was in there, and, and he got the people on, this, on the Mount of Olives and told them, everybody stand there, and the wall's just going to crumble, and you're all going to be able to go in. And they, they had little knives. They had a special word for him, and they were going to kill people. And listen, they came and Rome came and arrested and killed most of them, except the leader got away. So the guy's thinking, that's got to be Paul. And I'm thinking, he didn't speak Egyptian, he spoke Greek, dude. Why would you think he's Egyptian if he just talked to you in Greek, you know? How are you making that? How are you connecting those dots? He goes, are you that guy? And Paul goes, not hardly. Verse 39, Paul said, no, nah, man, I'm a Jew. You're a Jew? And these guys are trying to kill you. Yeah, they don't like me. Isn't it interesting that he says he's a Jew? Does that kind of blow your mind? Who's trying to kill him? Jews. Who would you be the maddest at? Jews. I would have said, I used to be a Jew, <laughs> but I'm really mad at the Jews right now. He says, listen, I'm a Jew, and I'm from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. Here's what he's telling him. He goes, man, do you know where I'm from? Listen, what he's saying to this guy is this. I'm a Roman citizen. That's who I am. Oh, no. Right? You're the commander now. You're going, uh-oh. This is not going to look good on my record. Hmm. He goes, man, this is where I'm from. And, and he goes, listen. He says, I implore you. Here's what I love. I implore you. Would you let me permit me to speak to the people? Here's what totally blows my mind. They got Paul on the steps. He got high enough. He could see the crowd. This is, this is my imagination. He could see the crowd. He sees thousands. And here's what I'm thinking, Paul. When he looked out and saw that multitude, here's what Paul, 20 years I've waited for this moment. 20 years. And now I can preach to all of these Jews at one time. I got a captive audience. They all came out. Yes! And now he's way up here again, right? He's not bummed out. He's looking at this as an opportunity that God has put in front of him to be able to share the gospel with a huge multitude. So he says, hey, while we're going in, can we just stop and have a little conversation with these guys? Just a minute. It'll only take a minute. And I'm thinking, he's got to be bloodied and he's got to be beat up some. But can I just talk to him for a minute? I love it, man. So listen. He says, so, verse 40, when he'd given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was great silence, now, don't you think that's a miracle? Listen, there's this riot going on. They're screaming to kill the guy. He stands up, and he's like this. And everybody gets quiet. That's a God thing, isn't it? Come on. That is the Holy Spirit working in a miraculous way to quiet that crowd. I, I read one commentary. He goes, well, now we know this is fictitious because that wouldn't happen. And I thought, you don't know God. My God can make that happen. And so listen, it gets silent. And then check this out. And he spoke to them in the Hebrew language saying, wow. Now this, after saying, that's next week. <laughs> Got you right to the edge and we'll come back next week. What did he say? So listen, man, but I, I want to make a point for us. You see, it's so easy to get discouraged. It's so easy to get, to get to the place where you get angry and you're kind of fed up, especially when people are attacking you. And shouldn't we instead look for open doors for ministry when that's going on? Shouldn't we be people who are not so upset to how they're saying those things, but you know what, that's on them, that's not on me. That's their problem, not my problem. I love what Pastor Chuck Smith used to say. He goes, listen, if people are saying horrible things about you, he says, if you try to defend yourself, God will let you. He says, you might just let God defend you. And he says, go on. And listen, Paul doesn't try and, he didn't try and turn everybody. And so you and I, listen, let's be some people. Let's take a few risks out there. Let's step out. Let's do some things. Don't be afraid of, you know, I, I shared, you know, I, I learned to fail early on in life, in school. I was one of those, you know, I had friends that got Fs and they were devastated. I go, it's not that bad. <laughs> it's 
really not that hard. It's okay. You'll get over this. You can make it through life. Now I find out that D's don't even count anymore. Somebody told me D's are not good. They were good in my world. <laughs> but you know what? The only way you will never fail is if you never do anything. And you don't want to be that person. You want to be a person, man, step out and do, so what, so what? How big is your God? You know, my God's big enough. He's picked up a lot of things after me, and he has to take care of me. And, you know, I think, you know, people talk about a guardian angel. I think I have several hundred. <laughs> and they're all juggling stuff. But you know what? Do stuff. Don't be afraid. Don't let the enemy beat you in that way. Trust the Lord. And you know what? You may get in a jam. Paul's in a big jam here. I have read the rest of this. You need to know something. This day changed his life forever. But he never regretted it. He stepped out and he went with those men. And his life's never going to be the same. We're going to read over 200 verses of things dealing from that action that escalated into another thing and another thing and another thing. And he stays arrested the rest of the book of Acts. But he doesn't regret it. He looks to see what God, doors God is going to open, and he uses those. And we need to be people who know that God knows exactly where we're at, and you know, wherever we're at, he's there with us. And that should bring us great comfort. Let's stand up and pray. <coughs> Father, I thank you for, again, just, uh, Lord, bringing your word to us, and Lord, being able to just read this and look at this section of Scripture and what went on here and what happened here. And God, I pray, I pray for myself, I pray for my brothers and sisters that we would be people, Lord, that we're not gonna shrink back from possibilities that you put out in front of us. God, we're not gonna be content to just be status quo. But Father, we're going to be men and women who trust our God, who step out and, and Lord, even when, even when it doesn't seem like it's going the way it should go, that in the midst of that, that we would trust you and we would know, God, that you're there with us every single step of the way. And God, that we would see you do things in our lives and things through us that we never, ever, ever imagined would happen. And God, yet you've put us in that place and allowed us to do that. And I'm gonna ask you to stay in an attitude of prayer for just a couple more minutes here this morning. <coughs> you know what, and, and uh, if you're here today and you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I know a lot of what we read and a lot of what we talked about might even seem a little bit foreign, a little bit strange because you don't know the Lord. You don't have that relationship. And, and I know we didn't talk about the gospel that much. So here's the gospel in a nutshell. The Bible says that everyone, every person alive has sinned. So if you're here today, you're, you're a sinner but everyone around you is a sinner. And that should give you some kind of comfort and, and uh, some kind of, quote, camaraderie. The news about being a sinner is, the bad news is, that because of your sin, you're separated from God. The Bible says if we sin, we, we, we die. Not dying so much physically as dying spiritually. And we're separated from God. That's, that's as bad as it gets. But the good news is Jesus Christ came, took your sin upon himself, paid that penalty of separation from God for eternity in a moment, in an instant of time, and he paid that, and now here's what he's doing. He's offering you eternal life. He's offering you a restored relationship with God because he took care of the debt that you owed. And he's holding out to you and saying, here, your debt is paid. All you have to do is trust me. So if you wanna do that today, Talk to God. Tell him. Right now, let him know, Lord, I want my debt paid. I want you to forgive me. 
And you know what? He will do that here today. So to help you along, I'm going to say a prayer. I'm going to say, uh, and, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. You can say it out loud. You can say it silently. Volume doesn't matter, but what matters is your heart needs to be sincere. Maybe you've backslidden. Maybe you walked away from the Lord for a while, and today you came to church, and, and God just pricked your heart. You know what? Come back to Jesus then. Say this prayer with us. Come home and come back to him and renew that relationship. Jesus, today, I confess to you that I am a sinner. And I'm sorry that I sinned against you, God. And right now, I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you today for your forgiveness. And now I want you to come into my heart and change me. Jesus, I want you in my life to guide me. Today I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. If you